Thank you, Courtney. And thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. As we on Nicity and ICU Talks and Mosaic Church partner together to bring your special event and talk about racial healing. ICU Talks normally meets the third Tuesday of the month, each month. And during the month between each event, all the volunteers that are here work diligently to put on the event to, to make it so that hour and a half, that hour and a half when you're here on that Tuesday night goes way beyond that hour that it becomes a lifetime impact in your life. And so this time we've only had about a week to gather together and to make this happen. But I know that God is in the center of this. The Holy Spirit is all around it. And that tonight will also have impact. And that we don't want what happens here tonight to just leak out. We want it to flood out and go out to this city. And that it is time for us to learn how to racially heal. And that's why we're here. And we've been in existence for about two years. And at this point, we're, we're eight months booked out when it comes to speakers. That God always brings people to us. There's so many stories about how we select our speakers each time. And tonight is no different with that. That God has selected who's going to be on this stage this evening. See, I want to hear from everyone. I want to hear from teenagers. I want to hear from black men, active police officers, Asians. I want to hear from all of you. But tonight, tonight God's decided who's supposed to be on this stage. And this won't be the last time we do this. We are committed to this wholeheartedly. So I know there's a message for you tonight. It might not come from me. It might come from Lucretia's mouth or Nathan's or Jason's. But God's going to pour something into you this evening. There's a reason why you're here. And so I'm here to give you a Christian psychological perspective. I'm here to talk about racial healing. There's three elements of healing that have to be in the foundation. See, we're all here tonight for the same reason we want to repair. Repair means move forward differently. How many of you are ready to do this differently? To do this in a way that we can heal and be together. On September 20th, three significant things happened in my life. One, it was the last ICU Talks event. It was the first time that I was not present. I wasn't here. The second significant thing that happened for me that day is why I wasn't present that night. And that is my father, who's a very healthy 72-year-old man. He works out five days a week. He goes to work six days a week. He had been sick for the past week. He had been diagnosed AFib and was being medicated. He walked into an urgent care, and he left there in the back of an ambulance being rushed to the hospital for heart complications. So I was at the hospital with him. So I know that y'all were here and you prayed for my family, you prayed for my father, and I thank you for that. He's doing better, he's able to sleep, he's eating some now, so thank you very much. Please continue to pray. As I've told my father, he can't leave me here with my mother. Like, it's just, <laughs> it's just not a good idea. So please keep praying for my father's health. I appreciate that very much. And the third thing that happened on September 20th, we all know what happened that day, that Keith Scott was shot and killed, and riots and protests started in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I am not here to talk about the particulars of the Keith Scott incident. I'm here tonight because I am outraged. I am outraged that racism exists. I am outraged that my brothers and sisters don't have equal rights. I am outraged that people across the board are walking around this place in fear and don't feel safe. I am outraged. And what outrage is, it means that I have a God-given anger. And I can feel that anger, and I want it to come out. I want it to have an outcome that, that ha lets positive change happen. That I'm not going to keep it in. That is my protest. I want that outrage to come out in the right way. But see, I, I used to be enraged. I was enraged for years. Enraged, what rage is, rage is not an emotion. Rage is actually a plethora of emotions that are trapped inside. It's shame. It's betrayal. It's disappointment. And it all stays inside. See, outrage is a voice 
Enrage is behavior and only behavior. See, I was outraged at times, but then so much of my life I was enraged. And that meant that I broke into places. I destroyed property. I shattered people. I physically hurt people, and I hurt myself because I was enraged. So when I heard about the rioters, I had nothing judgmental against them. Because for, for the grace of God, there go I. You remember a Polaroid camera? Remember what that is? When I am enraged, that's all I have is a Polaroid shot. That's all I can see. When I am outraged, I have a panoramic view. I can see perspectives. I can look at different angles. And I want to share some perspectives with you this evening. And we are not here to talk about gender equality, but I want to share a little story with you. I was five years old the first time I asked my mom what I had to do to be treated equally, treated the same as my brother and my, my dad. I was already very aware that I was excluded based on gender. But I also was aware that my brother and my mom were treated differently by people. You see, my mother's from a different country. My mother's from Panama. She's full-blooded Hispanic. I am Hispanic. And she's a traditional Hispanic woman. She's absolutely beautiful. She's stunning. She's dark skin, dark hair, just a beautiful woman. And my brother looks like her. So when we were kids and we would go around other kids, they would always ask which parent was black. And then there's so many times that the N-word was yelled at my family because I didn't understand. And my brother told me that throughout his life, people would tell him that he would never be white enough, as if white was the goal. See, I, I have a little perspective on what it's like to face racism. But I want you to know I also have perspective on being an officer. For two and a half years in the state of South Carolina, I served my community as a probation and parole agent. And that is nothing compared to our officers who are on the streets every day. But in South Carolina, you go to the police academy, so that's what I did. I had a badge, I had a gun, executed my own arrest warrants. It's a very difficult, demanding job. I have absolute respect for our men and women in uniform who are truly going out to protect and to serve. So I have a perspective on racism. I have perspective on being an officer. But what resonates the most with me, what I understand the most, is emptiness. I know what it's like to feel powerless, to be held down. I know what it's like to feel so empty inside that the only friend I had inside of me was shame. I, just like you, were told so many times to not be myself, that who I am is wrong, that I wasn't good enough for so many different reasons. To not be me. Even two weeks ago, two weeks ago this night, I was at the hospital, and I was talking to the nurse in charge, and my mother was there. And you would think my mother would be grateful that her daughter could speak medical lingo and find out what's going on with my father. But my mother screamed out when I was talking to the nurse. She said, Kim, stop it. Stop talking. She said, stop being you. Her exact words. She said, stop being you. I know what it's like to feel empty and be told to not be who I am. But no one's ever told me to not be white. People have denied my ethnic background, and they don't think I'm Hispanic. I really am. I am Latina. It's true. But no one's ever told me to not be white. So the fact that that message, that people hear that every day, that hurts me. I am sorry that you're told not to be exactly who God has called you to be. For whatever reason it is, I am sorry that shame even exists. I know what it's like. I feel empty. But one day, one day someone came along and they sat beside me and they gave me the gift of empathy. Let me tell you what empathy is not. Empathy does not mean that I know exactly what it's like to be you. What empathy is, it means I don't know what it's like to be you, but I am willing to sit beside you as you go through whatever it is. That is empathy. If we're going to get from empty to empathy, we need one word, two letters, A-H, ah. From empty to empathy is ah. You know when you're trying to explain to somebody something going on with you? And all of a sudden they go, ah. I get it. I get it. 
or you're explaining something painful, and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Awe is that sense of some relation, some, some connection, a range of emotion that there's some understanding what someone went through. And you say, ah, oh. we are called to be each other's ah. Oh. So when you have empathy and you're someone's ah, oh, that is the gateway. Empathy is the gateway to compassion. Compassion is relational. Compassion is action. So if I'm giving you empathy and there's compassion, and compassion means that I'm willing to sit beside you, and I'm not going to do it perfectly, nor am I going to expect you to be perfect. But I'm going to ask you questions, and I want to see what you see. I want to know what you're going through. That is compassion and empathy coming together. Let me show you. These are, these are my glasses. They are prescription. So, Brother Dwayne, let me. See, these are Dwayne's glasses. This is what he has you're crooked, brother. <laughs> You're the cutest crooked I've ever seen. <laughs> this is his life experiences. This is how he has seen the world. This is what he has been through. So when I put them on, it's blurry. Because this is what he's seen. But you know what? I'm willing to put his glasses on, and he's willing to look through my lenses as well. That is compassion. We are called and be empathetic and compassionate with each other. Compassion is action. I protest daily against racism. I protest daily against exclusion. It is my job to be compassionate. It is an action. I am to look around and see who is being excluded in the name of God to know that they are meant to be included in God's love. I am to be those glasses. Two weeks ago, after the incident, I went to Target, and I pulled in, I got out of my car, and I was walking by this young man's car, and he was a black man, and I noticed his gas tank lid was open. So I walked over to his, side, to his driver's side window, I waved, and he put the window down. You'd think he'd be scared of my muscle. He wasn't. <laughs> Shocking. He put the window down, and I said, hey, I said, your gas tank lid it's open. Would you like me to close it? And he said, you know what? It's broken, but thank you. He said, that's awesome. See, we had an awe moment. That simple. We had an awe moment. In the month of July, when there were other unfortunate tragedies in this country, we go here to Mosaic Church. It's where I attend. And our pastor is very open and talks very clearly about racism and what's happening in our country. And he had just finished a powerful sermon about what had happened. And then Jordan, who was just here, came out and sang a song. And I saw a woman standing right over here, standing near me. And I've always been drawn to her. I don't know why, but I've never really had a chance to talk to her. And I looked over at her, and she was just crying. So I went over, and I hugged her. And we just held each other. And she just cried. And so did I. We had an awe moment. Now, every Sunday, her name is Lenny, every Sunday when we see each other, we hug and we check in on each other's week. Now, every week, we have an awe moment. My last example for you. As Courtney said, I am a runner. So either in the morning or late at night, I go for a run. I am a horrible runner, okay? But I love waving at people and their doggies and saying hi to people. And so part of what I do when I'm running, if I see a black person, I high-five them. Now, you're going to say that's discrimination because I don't high-five white people. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you why. The same reason I wouldn't put stitches right here on my skin. There's no wound. I don't need to stitch something that's not wounded. My brothers and sisters out there are wounded, and I high-five them. I want them to feel the sense of touch that I love them. And now, whenever they see me coming, they just go ahead and put their hand up. <laughs> see, I extended my hand, and now they extend their heart. Empathy, compassion, touch, the three things we have to have in order to have healing.
Please don't believe the lie. The lie of the enemy that you can't make a difference. You are the difference. I talk to everyone because I belong to the one. I love all because God is all loving. Without God, I fall to pieces. With him, I am peaceful. He took me from enraged to outraged, from rioter to loud mouth Jesus lover, from troublemaker to peacemaker, from excluded to included, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. I, we are chosen. We are to be the difference. So speak up, speak out, speak and listen. From empty to empathy, be somebody's awe. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you.